All right, the recording is in progress. Uh, and in fact, because this very much is going to be the, uh, the Ron show tonight, uh, I'll, be... <laughs> I'll turn it over to him to start. Okay, well, so, I mean, I'll, I'll pull up the slides in a minute, but, you know, what we're going to talk about tonight is um, oral history, recording the, the stories from your community and from your family. Um, you know, we, we can talk, we'll leave plenty of time at the end to kind of talk about this and question and answer, um, but just curious, um, before we get started, has anybody beyond, obviously, our staff uh, conducted an oral history interview with anyone? Mm -hmm. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, let's, we'll, we'll kind of jump you through, give you the basics, and then we can talk through some stuff. All right. Make sure this screen share is going to work. Do, 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 do. Ta -ta. Okay. All right. So what, what are oral histories? And that, I mean, that's why we're here really. Um, oral tradition is, is the, oldest form of storytelling and, and recording of history. You know, you can even say uh, some of the oldest books out there are based upon this oral tradition. You know, even, you know, the Bible and, and others, it's just that continuation of a story. So, so the idea behind it, it is to capture memory and, and talk to folks about their memory and and their life. It, this is not a um, interview that you would do for a newspaper. This is not a, you know, an inquiry. It, it, you know, an oral history is really just a conversation with someone to, to understand their experiences and their time. You know, it, it is to um, allow folks to tell that story in their own voice. And so a lot of times with, with folks doing oral histories, you know, for us, we do them, we do them a lot with steel workers and people who lived in the communities when we're trying to learn about their experiences. And we talk about what work life was like and what it was like growing up or their first experience in the mill. And it's so that we can better understand their time. And, and we can use these materials to learn about when they were working and, and, and their experiences in their community, but then it also allows us to, to properly interpret that time and to talk about that time in the voice of the people who lived it. That's why it's important. For a lot of folks, doing oral histories really is um, based around family and community. You know, the first oral history I ever did was uh, with my grandmother. And it, it was interesting, um, <laughs> but it, it, that's what a lot of people do. It, it's interviewing family members for genealogical research, just for the family record. So, you know, why are they important? Because as it says here, it, it, it helps people to understand the relationship between personal experience and historical context. You know, me memory is a funny thing. You know, um, people tend to remember the really good and the really bad. And what oral histories can do is help capture not just that part of it, but to stimulate memory and, and get people excited about talking about their time so that those everyday things are, are recorded and captured. So, you know, the big, the big part of it is identifying somebody that you wanna, wanna interview. For, for us, what we've done in the past is putting out, oh, sorry, my, getting text messages. I thought I'd close that, excuse my noise. Um, but, you know, it, we identify folks that um, in a few different ways, some people come to us and say, hey, I worked in the mills or I grew up in Homestead or I lived in the ward when the ward was there and I'd love to talk about that story. In other, other situations, we reach out to people because we think that it would be an important story. But, you know, oral histories have been used in projects all around the world for, you know, again, anything a, a, as simple as recording the history of a neighborhood to, you know, the Holocaust Center in Washington, D.C., and even local ones as well, to record the memory and the story of the people who lived through a very important time. 
So it could be, you know, you're interested in learning more about, you know, um, what was it like living in Munhall and, and when John Kennedy was killed? So it could be very specific of what you're looking for, but generally oral histories tend to be more wide ranging. It, it, it is that life story or at least a segment of the life. Um, again, for us, a lot of times it's really focused on growing up in community, their work life, you know, what was it like in the mill? What was it like in that community and what changes have they seen? And, and it, it is a fantastic record of the time. But to do this, you know, to get this all set up, you know, you have a candidate, you, you want to talk to them. Um, you want to be in a place that is quiet, distraction free, um, which isn't always easy to do. Um, you want to have that person feel as comfortable as possible. So, so it's always a good idea that before you start interviewing someone that you talk to them a bit, spend a little time with them, you know, whether it's talking on the phone or even, you know, nowadays you can text message with each other, whatever it may be, so that you're not really complete strangers. And the reason for that isn't so much that you want to um, prep them for an interview. What you want to do is get them to relax. You want to have rapport. Because once you get to that point and you have rapport with this person and they feel comfortable, you're going to get a lot more out of them. You know, especially for folks who are not used to being interviewed, that are not used to having microphones up front of them. I mean, I did an interview last week with, with an intern of ours and I put six microphones in front of this poor guy. And luckily he's someone who isn't intimidated by that, but other, other people can be. So you want them to feel as much at ease as possible. So, you know, again, you wanna be somewhere that's relatively quiet, you want distraction free, but you also want the folks to relax enough. So one way to do that is to, um, as I said, have a rapport with them, but also before you really start getting into any sort of meaty questions, just ask them, you know, what they have for breakfast? You know, what was their morning like? Get people in that, that talking mode, because that's really what this is about. This is more conversational and memory than it is um, investigative which is really the best way to put it, I think. Um, you know, the, the next part's talking about that interviews with, with multiple people can be difficult. Um, that is, that's an understatement. You know, a, a lot of times, you know, you, you, especially if you're doing a family thing, you know, there's a family reunion. You have a bunch of people in town and you're like, this is great. I'm going to get my aunts together and we're going to sit in a room and I'm going to do an interview. What you end up with in many cases is a group of people talking over each other, stepping on each other, or doing something that's in some ways even worse, which is um, shortcutting the story. An example, and, and you know, Ryan has probably heard this a million times. Uh, you know, an example is you, know, you, you have two family members together and they're, they're talking and they'll be a, you know, you remember Uncle Oliver? Yeah, yeah. You, you remember what he was like? Yeah, oh yeah, I remember what he was like. And then they move on to the next thing. So, it, so it's very difficult. It, you want to get in, it, as much as you can, because I understand there are, there are times that, look, this is your only opportunity. It's the only way you can do it. You will have these people together and you make the most of it. However, ideally, you don't want to do that. You want it to be a single person. There's, there's just too many, too many cases where people can get in each other's way. Um, next thing you want to do is, you know, make sure, be, actually, before you start recording, you want to make sure that your equipment is functional. There's nothing worse than doing an interview, and I'm speaking from years of experience with this, and it's happened many times, that you think the camera's running, or you think you have fresh batteries, or you think the recorder's going and you get to the end of the interview and it's not. 
So you have just had probably whenever this happens, it's like the best interview you ever did. That's just how it is. And you find out you lost it. So one thing that I, that I always do is I, I check all the equipment beforehand and I also have a fail safe, meaning I, I never record with just one device. In this day and age, and we'll get into this in a minute, you can use your, your cell phones and iPads and all kinds of other things. But I, I, from a professional standpoint, what we do is I will record audio and I will record video. So if you lose one, you have the other. And it's just that fail safe so you don't run into that problem. Um, you also want to, as I said, you want to make sure that the subject understands the process and what you're gonna be doing, um, and that it, it is a situation where they're relaxed and they don't feel like they're, they're um, being grilled. You know, you don't want that old police station thing with the light in the eyes, you know, pushing them into that. So it, you want them to relax, talk, just let it flow. Um, so what kind of equipment can you use? Uh, as I said, you can, you can use a cell phone. Uh, they are to the point now where the recording quality and the video quality is so high that it's better than most equipment that we own. <clears throat> I have cameras that we've been using for years that um, we, you know, they were expensive, very expensive cameras, very high-end cameras. What you can do on a cell phone now is so much better. You know, a lot of cell phones, you can record um, 4K video, it's or you know, HD video. So the, the, the picture quality is amazing. The audio is good. Um, if you're using microphones, you can, you can use external microphones with um, iPhones or iPads. I just been testing out new ones. And some of this, when we send information along later, there'll be some links about how to do this, um, but just make sure they're working. But it, the idea is you want to have some flexibility within this. You don't need to go out and buy a bunch of equipment. You probably already have it. And if all you have is um, an old cassette deck, use it. Use whatever you have. You know, if you have to write things down, do it. Don't lose the opportunity because what's important in all of this it is that you want to preserve the story. The story is what matters. This opportunity to hear that. Um, you'll want to have an notebook with you and some paper and something to write with. Um, and we, we can, we'll talk about that a little bit and that you wanna come in prepared, you know, have, have some questions or at least topics outlined and, you know, be able to take some notes while you're writing. And this is another thing that, that it's important to, um, to tip off the subject ahead of time, talk to them about this, that you may be writing down notes you, know, you may be, while they're talking, writing something down. You don't want somebody worrying about that. A lot of people get very paranoid. It's, it's like going to the analyst. You know, and you're, 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 you're talking to, <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist keeps saying, hmm, and writing stuff down. And you're like, oh, my God, what are they writing down? So you don't want them focused on that. So just let them know. You might be writing down a keyword or a subject that you just want to come back to. This is all a memory jog for you, not a, not a uh, critique of what they're saying. So again, it's putting people at ease, but keep track of these things. Um, then for storage, um, an external hard drive, um, your computer, have, it, have a uh, thumb drive that you can use. Even when you're using your phone, these are pretty sizable files. And, and just something I discovered last week, because I hadn't done a whole interview on, on my phone before this, um, is that they're big enough that you can't just send it as, as a simple attachment. You have to embed it into the email rather than the other way around. You may have to download it onto the computer and then send it. Um, it it's just something to be aware of. And you'll get, you know, you'll, you, know um, you want to have storage for them. I Before we move on part? real quick, Ron, I just want to go back to something you said, which I think is a is a good point where you mentioned sometimes it's better to come in instead of with like questions as such with topics and just, just to explore that a little bit more and you know we are kind of on conducting an interview here but um to, to just extend that a little bit more um sometimes if you ask a question again i'll use an example that um 
you know, would pertain sort of more, I guess, to where we talk. But, you know, we, again, like Ron said, we interview a lot of people who used to work in the mill or worked in an industrial context. You know, a, a lot of questions when you ask them, if you're, if you're just asking, if you have your list of questions, you can run through it really quickly because you could say something like, you know, you know, did you work in the mill? Well, yes. Where did you work? You know, I worked at Edgar Thompson. Um, where did you work at Edgar Thompson? Well, I worked in, you know, I worked in the, in the cast house. You know, if, if you have this, but however, if you come in with more of topics, so you say, what was it like to work in the mill? You know, what was it like to live in Homestead? What was it like to, you know, um, live through X decade? You know, when you give people more room to talk, um, not only will it help you get a better interview, it also kind of prevents you from getting into a situation where if you have this list of questions that you've come in with, you could burn through those questions very quickly in some cases, depending on how you phrase them. So it's a good idea sometimes when you think about who you're interviewing and like what kind of actual information you want to get, instead of asking these kind of closed off questions that in a sense have a much more kind of concrete answer to ask questions that allow the person you're interviewing to kind of expound a bit, you know, that, that allow them to kind of speak to an issue rather than answer something as such. So, you know, and, and this, you know, I, two lines that I, that I give almost every beginning oral historian and intern and anybody that works with us. Um, don't be slave to your questions. You may come in and, and if total disclaimer, I don't come in with, with written down questions. It's all your comfort level. If you, you know, for some people, they have to have that. And, and there's, that's a wonderful thing. That's great. I don't do it because I get distracted by it, but that whatever works for you. But when I say don't be slave to your questions, it, it's you know going back to what Ryan said, but the, the important part of that is you may come in with 12, 15, 20 questions, whatever it might be. Don't rush through them, first of all. But secondly, if, don't worry about it. Don't just think, oh my God, I didn't ask this question or start thinking, I better ask this question now before they get any further, which leads to the second point, which Ryan was talking about that I always tell everybody is let, let the subject wander, but not get lost. And by that, I mean, give them that room, give them room to think, give them room to um, meander a bit and tell a story and let a story grow, but don't let them get too far afield. It is very easy for someone to start on a story and get off on a tangent that is pulling you well away from what that first story was. So pull them back gently, but try not to interrupt them. Try not to step on what they're saying, but let them kind of work through it, and pull them back. So yes, have, have some questions you'd like to hit, but if you don't hit them, don't stress about it. And don't stress about it for a few reasons. One, because a lot of times that that answer is going to come. You know, the answer to that question is going to come somewhere else in the interview. They're going to get to it. And, and the other part is, is if you get stressed about it and you start worrying about it, they can feel it. And they'll start to, to worry about it and start thinking, oh, my God, am I saying something wrong? And, and they'll, they'll, they'll get lost in that. Um, so when you are asking the questions, you want to keep them as open-ended as possible. The last thing you want to do is give someone an out. And by that, I mean, you know, if you ask them yes or no, black and white sort of questions, some, some people, a lot of people who are already probably a little nervous because they're not used to being interviewed will go with the shortest answer. Now, I can tell you right now, if you sat me down to ask, you know, to interview me, you don't, you probably don't have to ask anything. You guys have spent the last few weeks with us, you know, um, I, I'll just talk, but that, that's me. Not everybody's like that. I've done some interviews with folks that are wonderful speakers, tell wonderful stories, but they're nervous. And they will give you simple one to few word answers. And that's not what you want. So you want to keep, you know, question of, you know, did you work in the mill? 
You don't want to ask it that way. You want to ask something along the lines of, what was it like to work in the mill? You know, if you're asking them, you know, did, did you grow up in such a place, whatever, you want to know, what was it like? And, and then when they're answering, if they hit something that you don't understand, um, you're interviewing again somebody about steel mill and they keep referencing, I worked at OH5. If you don't understand, or even if you do, that doesn't mean that whoever's listening to this story down the line will know what that is. So it, it's good practice to slow someone down and say, let's go back to OH5. Can you tell me what OH5 is? Or tell me what about OH5? Um, what was it like there? What did they do there? Because the point is, is you want people to explain as much as possible about their lives and not make any assumptions that whoever's going to be listening to this, whether it's the interviewer or someone a hundred years from now will understand what that means. So define as much as possible, have them go back and, and which I'll go back to, you know, doing an interview with multiple people. That is one of the biggest issues, as I mentioned earlier, is, is that they will not give complete answers a lot of times because they, they think that you know what it is. So your job is to pull out as much as possible. Um, you know, so if you look at this guide here, it's keep the questions brief. Don't bombard them with a handful of questions at a time. Take your time. You know, it, it, it's, it's something that you want it to build. You want it to, to give them space, allow for that silence, allow for someone to think. Like, and it's not second nature to most people. So they're going to try to gather their thoughts. You know, um, you know there's a sequence in your questions. You, you don't want to say, you know, be talking about working at OH5. And then suddenly, you know, jump to a question about their 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 dog when they were a kid, unless there's unless there's a tie-in. So kind of keep these things flowing and going together, and be flexible in your approach. You again, going back to your questions, you may have fifteen questions set out, but you may go down a road with that subject that is exceedingly interesting. Be flexible. You know, give them the space to go there, but also give yourself that space and luxury to um, kind of go off script because you never know where it's going to lead you. And actually, a lot of times it leads you to the best stuff, to the, to the, the juiciest stories and most interesting things. And, you know, give them that room. Don't interrupt them. And lastly on here, which I think is actually the most important, is do not challenge their memory. You can go back later and in the, in the interview and ask a question another way, perhaps, or frame it within the context of something else without being um, blatantly obvious that that's what you're doing. Um, you know, it, you know, it could be, gosh, I'm trying to think of a good example, going back to Kennedy assassination and somebody keeps telling you it was, you know, 1958, you know, and they kind of had some stuff off there. Don't jump into it and say, no, 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 that was November 22nd, 1963, which yes, it was November 22nd, 1963. Um, <laughs> but don't step on them there. It, it really, it, it's something that you can get that material later. You can back that up by doing some research and, and you don't want someone to feel like you're, um, a questioning their memory, but also that that you're smarter than they are. You know everything, um, which is which is another point in all of this is be prepared, but don't come into an interview trying to dazzle somebody with how much you know. This is about getting to let them tell their story and tell you what they know. It's nice to understand the subject. You want to go in a little grounded if you can, 
so that you can help guide questions and help guide the, the, the flow of an interview, but you never want to appear to be so smart that either A, they'll be intimidated by that, or B, the other thing that happens, which I've referenced a number of times, is they'll start speaking in shorthand because they figure you totally understand it. Yeah, and that B can be, again, that can be particularly difficult in a lot of circumstances where you're trying to get good information and they sort of assume that you already know, or maybe because you do know, you know, quite frankly. But again, you have to keep in mind that, you know, sometimes you, you know, a lot of times you're conducting an interview. Yes, it is. It is for you as well. But in a lot of cases, it's for someone down the line who's going to be listening to this. And again, that can fall into the realm of something, you know, in our case, a lot of times something technical, you know, we know what a lot of these industrial things are. So when we're interviewing someone, they, um, you know, they just say, well, you know what I'm talking about. And you have to have them explain that in some cases. But again, where that also could be an issue is if you, even if you're just interviewing family, you know, it, it's, it's difficult a lot of times to interview family because, because there's that sort of common background between the two of you. They oftentimes, you know, they know that you know how things are. You know, they'll be talking about, you know, Uncle Billy and they say, well, you know, Uncle Billy is. But again, you may know how Uncle Billy is, but you got to say, well, how is Uncle Billy, right? You got to have them sort of explain themselves, right? Because the, the, the key here, again, especially with families, you know, the prospective audience is going to be someone down the line who chances are is not going to know any of the people involved, right? So, so the, the key, again, it, you, you got to make sure, like Ron said, first of all, again, if you go in trying to dazzle someone with how much you know, you know, um, like you said, on one hand, you know, that might scare them, but, you know, the flip side of it doesn't scare them. They say, okay, well, yeah, then you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's, it's again, you got to remember that the goal here is, is to gather information, right? Um, so both, again, don't go in sort of acting like you know too much, even if you do know it, because that can lead to not getting good information. And again, if someone starts slipping into the idea that you, you know, because you, the interviewer, know what they're talking about, um, again, make sure you sort of sometimes you got to kind of press back on that a little bit because the, the goal is to get information for not just you, but whoever else might listen to it. Yeah, you just circle back, circle back and get some definition. Um, you know, what, one other thing with family members um, <clears throat> that makes it very difficult. And I, I know that this is how, you know, what a, the, what a lot of folks, that's their experience with doing oral histories is talking to family for genealogical purposes. You know, some family members just aren't going to open up. They're going to be hesitant. They would be, they may tell a story to me that they won't tell to you because either it's something that they are embarrassed about or it's something that they feel you might be judgmental or whatever it might be. So just understand that, that, that. Interviewing family is great. I think everybody should do it. Um, I learned so much about um, my grandmother's life. Some of, you know, I knew some of it, but I didn't know the depth of it. I, even more so, I learned more about what it was like to grow up in the Lower East Side of New York in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s. So it was great stuff. But I also know, because I know my grandmother's life story outside of what she told me, that there was a lot of stuff that she kind of skimmed over because she viewed them as skeletons in the closet. So just understand that. And while we're talking about this, I keep thinking about the, the idea of memory, right? One of the things that we have to remember is that memory is fallible and it changes. So if somebody tells you a story one time and you think, oh gosh, this is great. I gotta, I gotta get them to tell me this story again on the record, right? I have to record it somehow. And then they tell you the story again and somehow it's either just a little bit different so that it's noticeably different or it's completely changed. That might just be the case. That just might be how they are remembering something and how they are choosing to talk about it on any given day because memories can be influenced by so many things, mm -hmm. right? So 
like, for example, um, I did an oral history with my own grandmother, who is 100 years old. And I asked her about this incident that she that she mentioned once. And it was about the time that they got, she and my grandfather and some friends got stuck at a funeral overnight because their car broke down. They had nowhere to go. So they, had, they got stuck at the funeral overnight. What she then told me the next time I asked her about it, can, I asked her, can you tell me more about this? She had failed to mention that she wasn't, they weren't just sleeping in the car. They were sleeping in the funeral home. <laughs> because it because it was warmer because she didn't say that it was in the winter time because she didn't remember that it was in the winter time the first time she told me about it so the same story gets told two times in two different ways because memory changes and also one way that she tells the story doesn't necessarily um invalidate or impact the truth or authenticity of the other version of the story Right. And along with that it is memory changing as time goes on. Um, events compress. Or if you're talking to someone about their neighborhood, and this is kind of reminds me, we have an exhibition in our, in our building that we're just about ready to take down by Kathleen Ferry, who's a wonderful artist. But, you know, the, the, the um, exhibition is called Memory Scenes because that's exactly what these are. And the oral histories are memory scenes as well. She is painting her community by memory. You're asking someone to paint a picture of their life by memory. So it may be that, you know, they're talking about the bakery next door to the newsstand, which wasn't really quite that way, or they could be, um, compressing years, something that happened when they were, you know, they're like, when I was in high school, this happened, but really it wasn't, they're a little off. That's okay. That's okay. You know, what you want to do again is, is capture this story. There's plenty of time to, if it's something that you deem important enough to go back and do some additional research and fill it in. Again, what your, your function here is is allowing people to talk about their lives and to record their memory for this and future generations. Because everybody, and this is another thing that you get a lot, is you start an interview and somebody will say, well, I, I never did anything. You know, I've never really done much. I've never done anything and that important. Everybody has led a remarkable life in one way or another. Everybody has wonderful stories that they can tell. And there are, that's what makes people interesting and fun. So once you can kind of break down that barrier a little bit, and that's done with rapport and, and with asking the right kind of questions and moving them through, even those people who are the most guarded will loosen up. They will loosen up. And, and so give them that space. All right. So here's the fun part. You got either of you have anything that you want to add before we move on to this? Okay. Here's the fun part or the part that um, <clears throat> I'll admit it as a, as a field worker for years, it's my least favorite part. Okay. And that <laughs> that's transcribing the interviews. And now maybe it's something that if you're doing an interview with, with family, you, you may not ever really get to. Um, but it's, it's important in a lot of ways because you're recording a, a, um, an interview on cassette tape or when I first started doing them, I was still using reel to reel, okay? Um, right, or mini disc, which we thought was the wave of the future and was the wave of about a five-year period um, or cameras change, media changes, you could lose that. So what is ideal in a perfect situation is to transcribe that interview. And it, and it really is exactly what it sounds like, that you're going to listen to the interview multiple times. You have to keep looping back, listen to that interview and record it on paper or in a computer, whatever it might be. 
you know, there's a general rule of thumb that I, you know, maybe it's changed some through the years, but um, when I was, uh, you know, going through oral history in institutes and doing other work, that we were always told that figure it is about six hours of prep time and um, transcription time for every hour of interview. There's more on the back end because you want to go through and you need to, you know, make sure you have things spelled correctly. You want to capture tone. That's hard to do. Think about, you know, you send text messages back and forth or you send an email and you can't tell whether somebody's being sarcastic or if they're serious. Okay. You're trying to record this person's memory and thought and you want to capture that tone because not everybody's going to have the opportunity to listen to the interview. So best you can with that. And there's, there's tricks to it. You know, you can, you know, if they laugh afterwards, you can put a little parenthetical laugh. You know, there are ways to do it or they smiled. You can add, you know, they smiled and, and winked, whatever it might be. Um, you want to listen to dialect. You don't clean, in, in my opinion, okay? And, and, you know, if either one of you two um, disagree, jump in. My opinion is you don't change a thing. You don't remove gutturals. And I've said I'm um, probably 500 times during, <laughs> during the course of this, this talk today, don't remove them. And why is that? Because it all matters. It shows pace, it shows intent, it shows, am I thinking about what I'm saying? Am I pausing for effect? It, it, it's just an important thing to show mm -hmm. emphasis and, and, and to, to, to um, really flesh out that person for the reader. Okay. If, yeah, if you're, if you're going to go serious about transcription, including, again, including as much of what's actually said as you can really does help because, again, it'll help the reader down the line assess what is being said, especially if they don't have access to recording, right, um, or can't listen for whatever reason to the recording. It'll, it'll, uh, you know, it'll, it'll allow them to get a feel for how something is being said. You know, if there's a lot of ums or ahs, you know, maybe it, it is because you know, if you're listening to the recording, you can tell that the person, you know, by the tone of their voice is sort of unsure about the answer they're giving, but that's not going to come across on paper, right? So, but if you include something like that, it can allow a reader to, you know, get a better feel for how something is being said. I mean, again, if you're, if you're stretched for time, you know, there's a lot of shortcuts you can take with transcription, but if you're going to do it and you're going to want to sit down and commit to doing it, you know, um, as well as it could possibly be done, yeah, including as much as you can is for the best. Yeah, and we'll try to include some examples when we send stuff along. Um, we have a packet of, you know, resource materials that it, we're happy to share. So, so with trans, transcriptions, there are three different ways to do it. And, and, and I'll go back to what I tell Everybody who's ever worked here or when I, you know, ran the oral history um, institute in, in, in Oregon with, with the Oregon Historical Society is your main, the main goal of all of this is get the story. Get the story. Worry about that first. There's plenty of time and, and interns that you, you can have to come in and do the, the transcriptions. In case of, you know, most people, I guess you don't have interns. But the point being is, don't don't be wrapped up in that. Get the story first. Uh, one thing that I will add with this that we didn't have earlier, it's a good idea, and even if you're doing this with family, um, create a document showing, you know, giving a little, you know, their full name and birth date and all that good stuff and where you were. Um, we use release forms. Um, I don't know that you necessarily need to do that with your family, but it's still a good idea, you know, stating that on this date, I did this interview with this person, and then they can put a little biographical thing about themselves. But going back to the transcriptions, there, there are three main types, and none of them, you know, none of them are wrong. They're just different shades of it and, 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 and um, completeness of the interview. There are subject indexes, where basically when you have a recording, 
you'd say in minute one through 10, you know, Joe talked about, you know, working at the beer distributor when he was a teenager. And it's 10 through 15, he talked about high school experience. Simple as that. And that the goal of that is so if somebody wants to listen to a recording in the, in, in the case of, you know, our archives, it's really handy for researchers so that they don't have to go back through the entire recording because they want to hear about the time that, that Joe, you know, worked at the beer distributor. So then they know where to go on the, on the, on the tape or video or whatever it might be. The next bit is a, um, is a, is doing a, um, oh my gosh. And so there's, I, I lost my train of thought, excuse me. Um, so you want to do an abstract. There we go. <laughs> um, where, where it is a summation, not just a couple of words, not just a subject index, but a summation of what happens in that minute zero through 10. It could be you know, bigger than that or smaller than that. You can break it down in whatever increments, but you're not doing a straight word for word transcription. And again, that works as a guide for people that are gonna be listening later. And then there's the, the, the full Monty with this. And that is doing a transcription where you are going from minute one to the end of the, end of the recording. And you are taking everything that's on that tape and putting it onto the paper. Those are exceedingly time consuming, but ideally that's what everybody likes to have in their hands. You know, um, and so whatever level you're comfortable with it, with doing, do it. It's always good practice to, to try to do this and work through it. You, you two experts have anything you wanna to add to that? I got a couple of things. I figured you did. You had that look about you. I usually do. Um, when we're talking about the way you go about making a transcription of the interview, one of the reasons why I think it's very important to include those filler words, um, uh, any of those guttural sounds, is um, because that does actually help you create context because they do change over time. As language, language is not a static thing. Language is never the same from generation to generation. It constantly changes. Um, and as it changes, making, uh, making space for those changes and understanding that just because it's different from what you're hearing or what you're used to hearing or what you yourself speak doesn't mean that it's wrong. And it also doesn't mean that it should be erased. So like make, I think it's important to keep those, those guttural sounds or those, you know, filler sounds because they actually help you create context and they also help you kind of understand where in time and space that person is and where their language is actually coming from. So I think that's one really important reason why um, you should keep and preserve those as much as you possibly can. Right. That's, a, that's um, a great point. That's a great point. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, um, when you're creating those abstracts, if, if that's the way that you wanna go, it's actually coming from, from since oral history and oral traditions or oral, oral storytelling is, is like the oldest form of storytelling we have, every move we make within that form of storytelling comes from somewhere. So if you go back and you look at books from the 16, 17 and 1800s, at the beginning of every chapter, you will find these very strange abstracts that will give you a summary of whatever is in that chapter. And there'll be these long rambly sentences that say this in which someone does this and then goes here and then sees this person and then talks to this person. It gives you the entire chapter. It spoils the whole chapter, but it gives you a sense of this is what it's going to be in it. And that comes directly from oral storytelling and the way that scribes would actually mark out where their stories began and ended. So. Well, that it. was amazing and scholarly and I really appreciated that. That, that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Ryan, have anything? 
Um, no, I don't have anything to add on top of that other than to say, looking at the time. Yep, that's why I was, that's why. <laughs> it I is had. about 6.50. So uh, now might be a good time. So that was the last slide as well, I'm pretty sure. Um, now might be a good time to open up the floor for questions if anybody has any questions about any of this stuff. I'll give everybody a chance to mull it over here for a moment. Yeah, that, that was a lot to throw. Interviews can be intimidating if you've never done it before. But just think of it as a conversation that you're recording. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I would say we, we've said this already, but um, again, if you're going to go and do, do an oral history with your family, just, just be aware that interviewing family, it can be really hard for a lot of different there's a lot of different reasons, whether it's a reticence to talk about something, whether it's an assumption that you know what they're talking about and having to clarify, you know, um, it, it, it can be, it can be hard. Only other thing I'll say, just because we mentioned this at the very, very beginning, um, do think about if you're going to do one of these, do think about the space that you're going to be in because it sounds silly, but, you know, anything that's going in the background, a ticking clock, fluorescent lighting, echoey room, um, you know, if you're going to put forth the effort to record one of these, just think about the, you know, all these minor things, because it, it will show up on the recording. Right. The and, and I will add to that. Um, it's a good idea if you know you're going to have these things happening to um, make note of it. And again, think beyond your moment and, and into the person who might be listening to this down the line. Mm -hmm. So if you're near a road and you know there's stuff going on point out that we are at the Bose building sitting in the front of the building there's a lot of traffic out on 8th avenue mm -hmm. so it explains those noises so it isn't a, a case of you know what is that what's going on yeah just something to keep in mind all right any any questions then from anybody who's thought of anything someone's gonna try it out with their uncle good luck have fun. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that's actually, I do have a question since yeah. I, I've done a few oral histories, but not very many. And one of the things that I'm always fascinated by is how people choose others to talk to. Like, how do you choose who is a good interviewee? Who is a good candidate for an oral history? Um, I mean, it, you know, it can, it can be based very specifically on something, but a lot of times I would say this is how you know, sometimes we do it at work, is by talking to people who we know, um, well, two things. One, people who we know to some extent will be a good person to interview from a speaking perspective. I mean, if you know for a fact that someone is not, because you, sometimes you know that someone is just going to have a really difficult time with doing the interview, um, you, you have to make a judgment call as to whether it's going to be worth trying to drag stuff out of them. Or if there's someone else you know who might be able to speak to that issue, it might be a little a little easier to speak with. I mean, the other thing is I think you just try and find, you know, you decide to, to a certain extent what you want to know, and you think about who you can interview who's best going to be able to speak to that, right? You know, if we're looking for, you know, someone who, who who's going to be able to talk about, you know, what was it like to live and work in both work in a mill and also live in a mill community nearby, right? You know, we want to think about who we know, who, who the, you know, who fits that description. You know, so when you're picking with someone, you know, think about, you know, the person just as they are, but then also think to yourself, you know, is there, I mean, it's a weird way to say it, but is there something they're actually going to be able to talk with me about, right? You know, sometimes you can see say, well, I want to interview, you know, I'll, I'll just interview, you know, Aunt Sally because I think she'd be willing to do it. But, you know, you can, everybody's life is interesting. There's always something to pull out, but if there's something specific that you want to know, you know, do think about who you could speak to that actually is going to be able to speak to that or speak to that period of time. Right. I mean, and there's a difference between a lot of what we do and what yeah. folks that are that are listening will do. Um, you know, we have a very um, specific area in which we, which we do these interviews. You know, a lot of times people are doing purely genealogical family based interviews. Um and you want someone that you know is um, is is willing to talk, but I, I will say sometimes they surprise you. The ones yeah. that you think, the ones that you think are going to be like, oh my god, this is going to be like pulling teeth. 
turn out to be the best interviews ever as soon as you get them to loosen up a little bit. You can get them to go. You can get them to go yeah. sometimes. You know? yeah. um, or the people that, you know, sometimes the quietest ones have the best stories. So mm-hmm. don't let don't don't let that scare you away. You know, don't let that scare you away. Basically, if you're trying to capture the story of your family or your town and you think that a certain person or a certain group would be good to talk to, give it a shot. What's the worst thing that happens? Mm-hmm. Worst thing that happens is you, you had a kind of tough interview. Um, best thing that happens is you learn some in- incredible, incredible stories about someone's life and the life they led. And and, and so, you know, again, I have had some interviews gone in where I'm like, oh my God, this person's going to be amazing because they're so outgoing and, and, and fun, fun to talk to. They were on my tour and they, they were, um, they just were nonstop. And then you sit them down and they're like, eh, so it can work both ways, but you know, I it just I don't be scared off, you know, and, and just take your time with the person and figure it out, or just get them really drunk. No, that was a joke. I'm just teasing. <laughs> and to close out with one final thing, just to remind everybody again, you've said it before, but one last time, before you do the interview, test all of your equipment. Equipment, exactly. See how it sounds. Make sure it's going to work. If you can, try it where you want to do the interview. But just make sure that it works because, um, as we said before, there's nothing worse than sitting down to do one of these and then finding out that there is an issue. <laughs> yep. So give it all a shot. Yep. Um, having backup is a really, yeah. really good plan. Yeah. If you can borrow, yeah, borrow someone else's phone, do two at once. Okay. Why not? I have had field workers insist that they'd be okay and then come back and find out that they got mm-hmm. nothing. Yeah, exactly. But folks, again, we want to thank you all for coming out here tonight. Um, thank you guys. If you guys have been around, you know, for the other ones, you know, thank you for stopping up. Like I said, it's been a good time. Um, you know, from our perspective too, by the way, you know, we, we are not going anywhere. So just to remind everybody again, you know, we do have an archive. It has a variety of oral histories, items, you know, all kinds of stuff that if you guys ever have a need to come and look at, you know, it's at the Bose building. 623 East 8th Avenue in Homestead. Um, we're on there right now. You know, we are open and free to the public. Um, you know, if you go to riversofsteel.com, you can find various means of contacting us. Um, and, you know, we could try and get that information out to you guys through our email address. But please, if there's anything we can help you guys out with, whether it's to see what we have, whether it's for advice on any of the things we've talked about. Um, you know, I, we are more than happy to, to you know, to talk to you guys. Um, so again come take a tour yeah it's summer's coming up here soon dairy furnaces will be open you know come take a tour come see our facilities you know take a walk down the pump house sometime if you're getting down the waterfront you know so yeah i other than that like i said you know it's been a pleasure to speak with you guys hope you all enjoyed it learned a little bit um and we will make sure that emily from carnegie library homestead gets not only this last recording but the powerpoint as well so that there'll be a way for you guys to access that good I, I thank I you. Appreciate it. Thank everybody. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks.